Good morning again. It says in Jeremiah 20, verse 7, in fact, the title in my New King James translation that I'm reading here this morning actually says, Jeremiah's Unpopular Ministry. And it says, O Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded, and you are stronger than I, and I prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. But when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me, a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak his name anymore. This is a prophet of the Lord saying he, he faced such a, 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 an outrage for his message that he was tempted not to talk about God anymore. Wow. Jeremiah the prophet. And why was this? Well, he says, his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up on my bones. I was wary of holding it back and I could not, for I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they said, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched my stumbling saying, perhaps he can be induced, then we shall prevail against him and we'll, we will take our revenge on him. In other words, what's he saying here? He was facing intense social pressure to be quiet. And he was tempted to do so. And you might be able to relate to that this morning because we live in a society which is in many ways has departed from its Christian roots, but also from the word of God. And our country has never been perfect, obviously. But we've seen in many ways the rise of many ungodly philosophies and beliefs in recent years in our society. And we're seeing also more and more people speaking out and getting punished by it in various different ways. And one of those people who's experienced that recently is my very good friend and uh, fellow Christian, Dave Peller, who I've invited to speak this morning on this issue because he himself has come under attack for speaking boldly and clearly the word of the Lord. And this is something that strong believers in the Lord have always dealt with, but it's also something that we need uh, insight into in our modern culture, because there are many different things which our culture and even the church just accepts, which is not right. And it might be uncomfortable to address them, and it might even cause a little bit of a stir for some people to do it, but it's really necessary. And I love how Jeremiah says there that he felt all this pressure to stay quiet, but the most important thing in him was the word of God stirring in him, which he couldn't hold back. And so we want to be encouraged to be like Jeremiah. So to do so, I've invited my friend David to come and speak this morning on this issue of paganism in our culture. So I'll hand it over to Dave. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Matt. Um, and if uh, the kids, are the kids being released? Not today? Okay. Buckle up, kiddies. <laughs> what time do we have? 10 to. Let's pray, shall we? Almighty God, the worst possible thing that could happen this morning would be a human, carnal, political agenda. But the best thing that could happen would be a divine, spiritual, biblical agenda. God, deliver us from political correctness. God, bring to us and reveal for us biblical correctness. Lord, I pray for the people who need to hear this word the most. May they be listening. May they hear this, either secondhand or directly, and may their hearts be soft for the seed of the Word and the teaching of the Holy Spirit. I pray for the hearers of this Word that not my words, but what Holy Spirit wants to teach the church in Australia today would be what is understood. Lord, let no one choose to take offence, for none is, none is intended or given. Lord, let people choose instead to be interested in and valuing your truth. Let us put aside adultery in our hearts. Let us put aside idols. And let us put aside anything that will come between us and the full knowledge of Jesus Christ, his word, his truth, his will, his ways and the gospel which saves our souls. We pray for our church that you would, the church in Australia, that you would prepare us as a spotless bride for our coming bridegroom. We look forward to that day and we say, come quickly, Lord God, Lord Jesus, come quickly. 
And in the meantime, help us to preach your word without fear or favour and to do the things that it is intended. That, Holy Spirit, your word would be effective and sharp to divide between soul and spirit, truth and falsehood, uh, true religion and falsehood, false religion. And uh, we just commit this entire message to you right now in Jesus' name and our hearing of it. And all the free people said, Amen. Amen. Well, this is a, um, a big word and a heavy word. And i am um, been preparing for it for maybe over a decade. At least a decade. Um, and I have been provoked recently to remove all fear and so I actually have to open with repentance that it's taken me so long to preach this word without fear because I have been afraid of what people will say. I've been afraid of being called racist. I've been afraid of hurting people's feelings and offending people unnecessarily. I've been afraid of my own personality of being cavalier and reckless and, and so I've withheld. Um, and, and being reserved and guarded. Um, and, and yes, it was, it was even in one of those guarded moments, somebody did take offence and made a complaint to the Queensland Human Rights Commission um, that their feelings were hurt. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that very briefly, but it's not even the topic because the problem is the church. The problem is the adultery of our belief. Uh, Paul warns, Opening with the accusation, you adulterers, why do you pursue friendship with the world? Don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility to God? And that's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of hostility to God. Now, of course, we're meant to be friendly to people in the world, but it's actually talking about the, the false belief systems of the world, the false values and priorities that the world has, to chase the world's approval. That kind of friendship is hostility, or in the older translations, enmity with God. So the first thing I want the listeners today to, to understand is please assume a love motive. If I misspeak, if I could have put things better, if I could have used a better tone, please forgive me, cover it over with the assumption that my motive is love. And if you can't, I'd heartily endorse switching off now. I'd also encourage you to choose a love response, that you actually love the Word of God and you love the people away from God who have any obstacle put in their way. But the gospel itself has no obstacle. The gospel is by nature offensive and exclusive of everything not true. And you can't widen the narrow gate. You can't make the difficult way more easy. You can't make the unpopular way that leads to life as popular as the way that leads to destruction. And that's how Jesus described himself and the gospel. To remove false religion from your culture is not to shame or reject your culture. It's to redeem and exalt your culture. Critiques of false religions are not vilification or humiliation of the members of the ethnic groups from which such false religions arise. Criticising Greek myths is not to hate Greek people. Criticising Roman mythology and gods is not to vilify Italians. Ancient Egyptian culture and ancient Aboriginal religion are not uh, a hatred of those people when they are critiqued and they all have their false gods. There are other false religions which aren't named for the ethnic group which developed them, such as Druidism, Islamism and Buddhism and critique of them is no more a slam or vilification of their typical ethnic group than criticising bad maths. Wrong answers to life's biggest questions must be confronted, if truth matters at all. And in the pursuit of safety, health, happiness, security, 
good philosophy and theology, prosperity, good science, liberty, and any useful quality of representative democracy, nothing is more important than the universal constant of objective truth. Shame on the laws in this nation, which make the pursuit of truth more difficult. Any argument against that bold claim that nothing is more important than truth can simply be refuted with the rhetorical question, is that true? You have to make truth claims to pursue excellence in any of those important social areas. So, if an ethnic group proposed as their ancient knowledge that two plus two equals blue cow, then it would not be loving to tolerate or affirm or celebrate the truth claim. It would not be racist or colonialist or vilifying or hateful to critique or condemn those claims and with authority and no false modesty, no pride, say two plus two equals four. I want to show the first video that we've got this morning of a Aboriginal gentleman who I knew of a long time ago and, and when um, my complaint at the Queensland Human Rights Commission became public, he sought me out, got my phone number and spent at least an hour on our first phone call together um, saying his story. He grew up in the Kimberley region in the north of Australia and he uh, grew up, he, in his words, half tribal. He's been exposed to a lot of the Aboriginal religion which most urban Aboriginals uh, have no first-hand knowledge of, no immersion in. Um, and even if they do and have a, a different opinion, that's okay because this is this man's testimony. This is his... And, and the long story short of our very long phone call together was Dave in absolutely every detail you are describing and teaching, you are 100% right. So let's watch this video and see what his testimony is of the difference between Christianity and traditional Aboriginal religion. And look at your time, we will never know who Jesus meant nothing, you know. We will still um, believe we will come from animal and that spirit world we will we were frightened by like a devil, and we would know how that spirit world he, he run, you know, how he operate. And, but we would still never know, you know, like Jesus. We would never been Christian, nothing. We would have been still, like what they call them, pagan, you know. We never know, being on the top, we are worshiping by the environment, we are worshiping by all the animals. But I'm hearing that word before, like that seed now, you know, from that God word, but get into my the spirit and they will grow and then the time will come then when I will ask Jesus to come into my life. And I will christen him from the time. And But people say to me today, well how, how come you can be Christian and you check him why you Aboriginal culture? And I will say to people, well I never check him why my Aboriginal culture. I will say I'm still an Aboriginal person. You know, but the only thing that changed like me I don't worship Dreamtime story anymore. I don't wor worship Dreamtime spirit. I don't bow down to like what they call them, ancestral spirit. I've been chucking away all that thing and I've been putting Jesus Christ in like his place. You know, that word people might use in Christianity. You know? The only thing I've been telling like, like myself is that religious side, what they call them, of Aboriginal culture. I'm still an Aboriginal person. I still eat them with guana, I still eat them with, um, with the bush tucker, where they call them the Kimberley, you know, like Minjara, and Ngawin, and Gordida. You know, I still talk about all the tucker, and I still I'm learn my mother's language. You know, I'm still an Aboriginal person. Nginji Ngarege Jandi, Nganyi Mwale Bimere Nyamani. That's my mother's language. Everything got to come through like this book. Amen. You know all the dream time story? Lovely people before got to come through like this Bible and we got to check them, got this book. You got to rise and fall with they say, I got this book. 
this the constitution, this the law of like God. Old Testament time and New Testament time. Where they're talking, God they're talking like the judicial law, you know, like same like Aboriginal people, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything, you keep, long time when you kill anybody, well, you, you gotta get killed too. And like we culture, you know, all the punishment been there, you know. But they they train him your first blood, like, what to do, what not to do. I don't grow up like that. I know that Aboriginal system. But today I'm Christian, eh? And I can't go back to like all the dream time thing. I still respect all of our law, Great you know, deal. where God has called judicial law, but ceremonial law and, and some of them customary law, because me Christian now, I can't follow them that thing. Because he tied up la, the spirit world, the dark side weapon before he said I'm, I'm not Christian, but because I'm Christian today, I am put Jesus like that place now. That, that's the only thing I've been changed is the religious side where people talk of my Aboriginal culture. Mm. Amen. God is not calling Aboriginal people to stop being Aboriginal. God is not calling Aboriginal people to abandon their culture. Just the religious aspects need to come under the discipline and authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as Brother Rodney shared, compared to scripture, compared to the authority of the word of God. Now, no society with an ambition to be good should presume the moral authority or qualification to police or regulate truth claims. The only authority granted them by God is to protect the free exercise of thinking, conviction, belief, religion, political expression and speech. And the only behaviours in this category they should presume to regulate, and indeed they must, are any behaviours which diminish the freedom of thinking, conviction, belief, religion, political expression and speech. So in fact, the anti-discrimination industry is a transgression of God's laws for government to protect. Instead of protecting free speech, they are diminishing and regulating the pursuit of truth. Romans 17 26 is very instructive in this. It says, From one man he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth. From that's one race. Determining their set times, there are seasons for the rise and fall of nations. And he determined the fixed limits, the boundaries and borders of the places where they would live. God determines the rise and fall and borders of nations so that they would search for God and perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Though I'm not preaching about misinformation, disinformation and anti-discrimination laws this morning, this is very instructive to that false and perverse legislation in all levels of government because... The reason God created nations and eventually the civil authorities which govern us are so that we can search for God, so that we can explore truth and perhaps grope around. We're groping around because we're in the dark, because we don't have complete revelation, knowledge and understanding. And that means it's God's permission and liberty for us to sometimes get it wrong. And for somebody to say, well, my feelings are more important than your search is unbiblical. The point is, though, that we find him. If the point isn't offence, the point is pursuit of truth. Because he is not far from each one of us. There is a fundamental assumption here in Scripture that truth is discoverable. We can discover and know truth. So the purpose of this message is, as I said, for the Australian church and anyone of any skin colour, giving honour and observance to the religious claims, ceremonies and rituals of traditional Aboriginal religion. If you give honour to demons, false gods, you are not a person worth less and you are not any less a bearer of the image of God than I or any other well-formed Christian, but you are a poorer Christian if you mix false religion with the worship, teaching and knowledge of the one true God. 
And it's not just Aboriginal false religion. We have many churches and Christians importing the pagan idea of millions of years into the creation narrative in Genesis. That is syncretism, mixing false religion with truth. We have churches, shame on them, hanging pride in sin flags in their sanctuaries. That is paganism. My objective this morning is to warn the people of God of the danger of mixing Christianity and the traditional Aboriginal religion. And given the prevalence and level of the normalisation of this mixing, of, uh, this mixing in Australian churches, I know Australian churches, good conservative theologically churches, who are doing smoking ceremonies near us. I was at another church in Brisbane recently uh, setting up for an event and overheard their service and they opened with an acknowledgement of country. It requires the use of a large amount of scripture and evidence this morning for us to presume to be able to offer this correction. For many will cling to their idols and only God's word can soften their hearts and open their eyes if they are willing. Holy Spirit, do it. Ezekiel 33 verse 3 to six says, the watchman sees the sword coming against the land, blows the trumpet and warns the people, but there is one who hears the sound of the trumpet yet does not heed the warning. Then the sword comes and sweeps him away. He will be responsible for his own death. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed the warning. So he is responsible for himself. If he had heeded the warning, he would have saved his life. But suppose the watchman, faithful Christians, see the sword coming, and do not blow the trumpet to warn the people, the people of God. Then the sword comes and takes one of their lives. He is swept away for his iniquity, but I will hold the watchman accountable for that person's death. Fellow Christians, let's no longer tolerate the mixing of false religion in Christianity anywhere. I want to uh, use some big words this morning, words that some of the listeners, I'm sure all of you know them, but um, for, for those people, for the recording, watching live or later, um, we're going to define some big words this morning. And the first one is syncretism. Uh, I'm going to read three definitions just to confirm it's uh, not randomly plucked to suit my purposes. Syncretism is the amalgamation or attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures or schools of thought. Syncretism is the combination of different forms of belief or practice. Syncretism is the process by which aspects of one religion are assimilated into or blended with another religion. This leads to fundamental changes in both religions. The false one needs changing. The true one does not. What is a part truth? A lie. In the Old Testament, God was deeply concerned with the pressure and temptation towards syncretism. As the people of God moved into the Promised Land, they were confronted with pagan religions. The Canaanite gods, Baal and Asherah, became objects of Israelite devotion. Later, God's people worshipped the national gods of Assyria and Babylon. The law of God clearly warned Israel not only against abandoning Yahweh for other gods, but against worshipping other gods in addition to the true God. The prophets warned of coming judgments as the people modified their faith to accommodate foreign doctrines and practices. If you have your Bibles, I've got five scriptures we're going to read on syncretism. Joshua chapter, Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. Now obey the Lord and worship him with integrity and loyalty. Put aside the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and worship the Lord. If you have no desire to worship the Lord, then choose this day who you will serve, whether it will be the gods whom your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But I and my family will worship the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 29. When the Lord your God eliminates the nations from the place where you are headed and you dispossess them, you will settle down in their land. After they have been destroyed from your presence, be careful not to be ensnared like they are. Do not pursue their gods and say, how do these nations serve their gods? I will do the same. 
you must not worship the Lord your God the way they do. For everything that is abhorrent to him, everything he hates, they have done when worshipping their gods. They even burn up their sons and daughters before their gods. You must be careful to do everything I am commanding you. Do not add to it or subtract from it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast affects the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch of dough. You are, in fact, without yeast. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So then, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of vice and evil, but with the bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. Verse 11, but now I am writing to you to not associate with anyone who calls himself a Christian who is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or verbally abusive or a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. Paul goes in those intervening verses where I jumped from verse uh, 8 to 11, he says, it's fine to be friends with unbelievers who are those things, adulterers, idolaters, greedy, drunkards, swindlers. But anybody who claims to be a Christian and is still doing those things, divide from those people. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 says, For there will be a time when people will not tolerate sound teaching. Remember, tolerance is for everybody except the intolerance. Instead... These people will follow their own desires. They'll even throw parades for them. They will, he didn't say that, that was my commentary. They will accumulate teachers for themselves because they have an insatiable curiosity to hear new things. And they will turn away from hearing the truth, but on the other hand, they will turn aside to myths. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 says, But examine all things, hold fast to what is good, Stay away from every form of evil. Well, the next word uh, Brother Rodney Rivers used, which I'm going to define and which I'm going to use a lot, is the word pagan or paganism. The dictionary says, when Christianity became generally accepted in the towns and cities of the Roman Empire, paganus or paganus was used to refer to a villager who continued to worship the old gods. Christians use the term for anyone not of their or the Jewish faith. The word in Old English for such a person was what is now heathen. Paganism, from the classical Latin paganus, which means literally rural, rustic or even civilian, is a term first used in the 4th century by early Christians for people in the Roman Empire who practised polytheism, multiple gods, or ethnic religions other than Christianity or Judaism. Alternative, it wasn't racist then, it's not racist now. Alternative terms used in Christian texts were Hellene, Gentile and heathen. During and after the Middle Ages, the term paganism was applied to any non-Christian religion and the term presumed a belief in false gods. Another term I've used accurately, which I've been accused of not using accurately, so I will define and let you determine for yourself when I demonstrate it, is the term animism. Animism has no relation to the word animal. Animism is the doctrine that every natural thing in the universe has a soul. If you believe in animism, you believe that emus, trees, mountains and thunder are all spiritual beings. I'm reading multiple definitions again to establish uh, the, the uh, consensus of this definition. Animism is belief in innumerable spiritual beings concerned with human affairs and capable of helping or harming human interests. And we will see that is exactly what Welcome of Country is said to be concerned with. Would you like me to read that one again? I'll just move on. Animism can be defined as a type of relational worldview in which the world and every being in it, including humans, animals, plants, land and water, are part of an interconnected web of being. 
In animism, humans don't hold a special title apart from other living beings, or even inanimate objects, rather. Humans occupy a relational role, just like all others in the web of life. The Latin root of animism is anima, which refers to breath, spirit, and life. The Greek word is pneuma, the Hebrew word, Pastor Matt? Ruach. Ruach. Thank you. I knew that. I just always forget. Animism is the belief that everything has a soul or spirit, and anima in Latin, including animals, plants, rocks, mountains, rivers, and stars. Animists believe each anima is a powerful spirit that can help or hurt them and are to be worshipped or feared in some way attended to. Animism is a primitive religion whose adherents have for thousands of years deified animals, stars and idols of any kind and practiced spiritism, occultism, divination and astrology. They use magic, spells, enchantments, superstitions, amulets, talismans, charms or anything that they believe will help to protect them from the evil spirits and placate the good spirits that are found everywhere in everything. Let's watch the second video now. Uh, and this video is from the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. This was established in 1964 by the Menzies government to record material culture and ceremonial life of Aborigines and is regarded as the premier information resource on Indigenous Australians. Let's listen to uh, Ngunnawal Elder Jude Barlow. Thank you. Being welcome to country means that you are talking to your spiritual ancestors and you're saying, just let this person come through. We trust them. We trust that they're not going to do any harm on this country and so do not harm them. So for me, the significance of being welcome to country is about ensuring your um, spiritual safety because um, my ancestors and I understand many other ancestors of other First Nations people are still present on country because they're still with us. They're in the animals, they're in the trees. And so when I walk onto another First Nations country, I, I look to be welcomed so that I feel a sense of that the spirits are okay with me being there. I feel such a grief for the Christians that practice an acknowledgement of country. They think it's nothing more than a passport or a visa or a handshake, benign and spiritually void. Maybe that's what they mean, but I don't think they know what it means. I mean, if you thought a Buddha statue was just a piece of stone, would you put it in the sanctuary? Would it be okay if you did? Of course not. To reinforce what she just said, quote, being welcomed to country means that you are talking to your spiritual ancestors and you're saying, just let this person come through, we trust them. We trust they're not going to do any harm on this country and so, so do not harm them. So for me, the significance of being welcomed to country is about ensuring your spiritual safety. Ancestors are still present on country because they're still with us. They're in the animals, they're in the trees. So when I walk onto another country, I look to be welcomed so that I feel a sense of that the spirits are okay with me being there. The second definition I read of animism was a belief in innumerable spiritual beings concerned with human affairs and capable of helping or harming human interests. But if anybody would like to cast their mind so far back as the recent referendum we had on uh, the Aboriginal voice to Parliament, enshrining a religious manifesto in our constitution, let me quote what the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which was the basis and foundation for Anthony Albanese's election night promise to implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and he said, in full. Here's what that statement claims to teach us about country. Our Aboriginal, this quoting, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes 
were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion. The ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil or better of sovereignty, end quote. That is talking about the ancestors still being here and occupying as the video uh, from that Aboriginal elder explained. The truth claims being asserted here are that country, the soil, is the place that spirits come from, that human spirits come from, and they're connected to the whole time, and that is also the dirt, nature, the eternal destiny of people who die. That's exactly what we're assumed to be acknowledging if merely present for the ceremony called Acknowledgement of Country. The Guardian, a famous conservative right-wing theological establishment, it's a far-left newspaper, I'm sorry for people who didn't catch that um, sarcasm, they reported in 2016 that the Aboriginal Australians Ernie Dingo and Richard Wally were claiming that this ceremony has thousands of years of history, but their ceremony in 1976 was the first to be performed in the country for non-Indigenous Australians. Richard Wally gave a preview of what he would say during a welcome to country. Quote, May the good spirit watch over you. You're looking at the land of my people we call Wadjuk. Later on when you go home to your country, may the good spirit take you safely home. May the spirits of my people and the spirits of your people watch over us now, end quote. When Nungbri elder Matilda House Williams presented Prime Minister Rudd with a message stick in 2008 and opened federal parliament for the first time with a welcome to country, she explained, quote, a welcome to country acknowledges our people and pays respects to our ancestors, the spirits who created the lands. This then allows safe passage to all visitors. For thousands of years, our peoples have observed the protocol, end quote. The Guardian reporting continues. In performing a welcome to country, Wally says ancestral spirits and spirits of the land are invoked to watch over our guests and our visitors while they're in the country, end quote. Ernie Dingo reportedly believes the ancient ceremony has the same religious purpose and spiritual weight as attending church. He's quoted, quote, you can't kill spirituality. You can't take somebody's soul. You can't kill the presence, the inner sanctums of spirituality. You can't do that, end quote. A few years later in 2019, I said I've been thinking about this for a long time. Five years ago, I published excerpts from a 10 minute long video of Richard Wally performing a welcome to country ritual at a Roman Catholic youth conference in Perth. I was horrified to think Christian parents had unwittingly sent their impressionable youth to be indoctrinated in such anti-Christian religious ceremonies. I republished that article recently. Here are the quotes I captured before someone wisely deleted the whole video. This is long, so bear with me. Quote, Richard Wally saying, when you see the tree and the river and the birds and the land animals as one, as brother and sister, then our world becomes a greater place. How do we see our tree as our loved one, as a brother or sister? Everything is created equally. And this is where we now, as an opportunity to remind us on the country that we stand on, that we are able to give you a sense of unity before you start to move all this beautiful energy once again for the next three days and you get a chance to be bathed on country, on the mother, the land we call home. As we stand on this beautiful country, look for the gift. It's there, the great mother, the land we came from. She has many gifts, many teachers, the bird, the tree. Why do we celebrate our birthdays? Why do we celebrate your life? Because as the sun comes up, our mother, the warmth, the bird goes, 
that's the magpie. He sings and he dances to the sun and the birds and the trees start to move with the wind as beautiful coolness comes across from the ocean and then the warmth from the desert comes back and you see the movement and the dance of all things. And when the sun goes down, it does the same. It slowly but surely drifts downwards and then you hear the bird come back again, more whistling, and they sing and dance again for the sun as it disappears into the distance. For us as Aboriginal people, to be still, to embrace the art, song, dance, language, story of everything. This is where our greatest teaching of the local tribe down here and right across Australia, we always have art, song, dance, language, story that connects us to the bird, tree, sand, the ant, the bee. I encourage you to lay underneath that Christmas tree for, you're one of the, for you are one of the greatest gifts that the universe and mother gave to itself. If you see our countrymen on country, They'll come up to the sand and go like this here. At this point, the speaker simulates kneeling down to gather sand in his hand and rub it on his body. Don't forget me, mother. And we rub everything on us because everything turns to dust. When we put the ochre on our body and our sand and our dirt and our ashes of trees, everything is connected. And we show our great country can you see me, spirit country? For there is where everything is connected, never separated. And now we say to those old people, bad spirit, go away. We don't need you right now. Good spirit, come. Sit, not in the air, but on our skin. And when you feel the goosebumps going over your body, hopefully transferring from one to another, that's the old people dancing with your spirit child inside you. Everything is born with the spirit. Let our spirits be connected for eternity. Thank you very much. May all the gods bless you. And may all our spirits give you goosebumps, not just for today, but for the rest of your life. End quote. Welcome to country. The thing is, this is not inconsistent with the widely published and understood meaning of the ceremony, as I've already been detailing. But let's move on to the Aboriginal flag. The national flag of Australia, the one that by definition isn't racially exclusive, features three Christian crosses honouring the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the one true almighty God as referred to in our constitution, the cross of St George, the cross of St Andrew and the cross of St Patrick. And if that's not enough, the cross that God himself hung in our skies, the Southern Cross. Now, there is no accepted, credible, sober, or any kind of expert analysis of the symbolism of the Australian national flag, which implies anything idolatrous or deifying of created things. People can make an idol out of anything that God created. That doesn't make it idolatrous inherently but some things are. The symbolic meaning of the Aboriginal flag, on the other hand, is far more problematic. Its designer, the person with moral authority over it, Harold Thomas, says the colours of the flag represent the Aboriginal people of Australia and their spiritual connection to the land. According to Carol and Richardson Flag World, who are the exclusively licensed manufacturer and provider of the flag, the symbolic meaning of the flag colours, as stated by its designer, Harold Thomas, are, quote, black represents the Aboriginal people of Australia. The yellow circle represents the sun, the giver of life and protector. Red represents the red earth and Aboriginal people's spiritual connection with the land and representing the blood of Aboriginal people, end quote. This symbolism is widely accepted as credible, sober descriptions as the symbolic meaning of the flag. For example, by Encyclopedia Britannica, University of Queensland, Queensland Health, the Victorian Public Sector Commission, Aboriginal Art and Culture website in Alice Springs, another website called Common Ground, Planet Corroboree, Art, Arc, and Kate Owen Gallery. I have web links to all of these. This is more than half a dozen. The land does not have a spirit, though. 
and no person's spirit comes from, returns to, or resides in it. According to the Christian gospel, it returns to God for judgment. Quote, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12 verse 7, quote, people are appointed to die once and then to face judgment. Hebrews 9 27, and the son is most certainly not the giver of life or protector as the Aboriginal flag declares. All things were made through him, God, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1, 3-4. Let's talk about smoking ceremonies. One uh, authoritative website, BW Tribal, explains, quote, Smoking ceremonies have been an integral part of Aboriginal culture for millennia, weaving together the spiritual, physical and social threads of Indigenous Australian life. These ancient rituals, still practiced today, hold a deep significance that goes beyond the visible act of burning native plants. They are a powerful means of cleansing, healing, and connecting with the land, the spirits, and the community. At the core of every smoking ceremony is the use of smoke, born from the smouldering of carefully chosen native plants. The smoke is believed to possess both spiritual and physical cleansing properties capable of warding off negative energies, purifying people and spaces, and promoting the overall well-being of the community. When a baby is born, the smoke welcomes them into the community and offers protection for both the child and mother. During initiation ceremonies, such as circumcision in some Central Australian groups, the smoke serves to cleanse and spiritually prepare the individual for their new role. Public ceremonies offer a chance for cultural sharing and reconciliation, inviting the wider community to engage with the spiritual life of Indigenous Australians. At their heart, smoking ceremonies are a profound expression of Aboriginal spirituality, deeply connected to the spiritual world." End quote. Another website, Deadly Story, shares, quote, a smoking is an important part of any ceremony and can also be performed as its own ceremony. Usually at the beginning of a ceremony, it accompanies a welcome and assists in cleansing the area and the people of bad spirits and to promote the protection and well-being of visitors, end quote. Can you believe a pastor would perform a smoking ceremony in a otherwise theologically conservative congregation? God forgive us. May we repent. The brother I showed on video at the beginning, Aboriginal Australian Rodney Rivers, courageously preaches, quote, There are two sides to Aboriginal culture, the domestic and the religious. Hunting, cooking, family relationships, etc. are part of the domestic side. The religious side involves ceremonies, rituals, spirit and idol worship, witchcraft, astral travelling, ancestral blood covenants, singing people with curses to hurt or kill them. Ceremonies and fetishes are used to seduce men or women into wrong relationships. Some men and women can even have a relationship with spirit beings. This all brings people into bondage to the spirit world because its foundation is animistic. It involves ancestral spirits connected to stones, trees, animals and the natural world. The Aboriginal Dreamtime is an evolution of Aboriginal myths and stories connected with fear and superstition. I know because I and thousands of others, Aboriginal Indigenous people, have come out of that background. These spiritual forces affect all people, both religious and secular, Indigenous and non-Indigenous. Aboriginal religion, along with the New Age movement, is part of the smorgasbord of the occult world. I want to tell these stories so that people will know that these curses are real and the ever-increasing number of smoking ceremonies are having devastating effects on people and the ecological environment. Aboriginal custom has always used protocols to welcome people to their land, but these smoking ceremonies are spiritual practices to appease the ancestral spirits. When some Aboriginal tour guide takes people into traditional places, they speak to the spirits in tribal languages and use rituals to appease the spirits first. Don't get involved in smoking ceremonies and these rituals. You will open yourself to the power of these curses. I come from a semi-tribal background where I have observed all these things 
from when I was a young child. It's only the blood of Jesus that cleanses and protects us. Satan is a master of deception, of tricking us into the ways of hell and death. We need the discernment of the spirit world that comes only through God's Holy Spirit. End quote and amen, Brother Rodney. Another Aboriginal Christian leader originating from the Roper River, Anderson George, has rejected Aboriginal ceremony, contrasting with those who wrongly believe they can be redeemed. You can't redeem pagan rituals. You can't redeem a Buddha statue. You can't redeem a Ouija board. You can't redeem pagan religion. Anderson gives thanks to the Lord for healing him from witchcraft in 1998. He says, quote, I was in the Darwin prison when God said, wake up, Anderson, wake up, to stop sinning. My sister Loretta kept praying for me even when I was an alcoholic and sniffing petrol. In 1998, I was saved and had a faith in Jesus as small as a mustard seed. I knelt down and was praying in my language, Creole. The Lord just spoke clearly, Anderson, do you want a good life or a bad life? I accepted Christ and I just cried more than I had ever cried. I had been dying slowly of witchcraft. I had a grandfather who was a witch doctor and I would question, how come he didn't heal me? The topic of being in and practicing the ceremonies was burning on my heart as an Indigenous man. The Lord really put it on my heart in 1998 to ask him a question. Reflecting back to when I was a teenager in 82, involved in sacred men's ceremony, I asked God, can I worship you, Father God? Can I worship you and worship my ceremony? My old pastor back in, I can't pronounce that word, where I come from, he worshipped he, he worshipped you on Sunday. And when the sacred ceremony was on, I saw him worshipping dream spirits, totems, ancestral animal spirits. Can I do that? Can I serve God and serve ceremony? God made me realise when I was being initiated that in these ceremonies we were worshipping idols. From that point on, I didn't want to believe and be involved in the old way or interfere with them. This has led to total transformation, freedom, healing and blessing. I did not directly talk to my old pastor about his view on sacred ceremony and it was only much later that I learnt that he later expressed concerns about the ceremony himself." End quote. Joy Sandifer worked for 25 years in the north of Australia with Wycliffe Bible Translators and the Bush Church Aid Society. She recalls how Aboriginal Christians there regarded smoking ceremonies. Quote, When a Christian woman died, her son and daughter-in-law, who were also Christians, saw no reason to have their house smoked. However, the grandchildren, who did not have the same Christian convictions, insisted that the house be smoked. The Christian couple went bush for the day and had nothing to do with the smoking. They moved back into their house the same day. I've been, hopefully, presenting more than enough evidence and corroboration and testimony to establish this isn't my opinion. This isn't just my opinion. This is the opinion of people who grew up immersed in these ceremonies. How dare we tinker with these and, and fiddle with these and bring this into Christianity when these people are trying to be released from the bondages of this witchcraft, this idolatry? How dare we pretend that it's redeemable? What a terrible signal to send. Look, even if it was, even if, and it's not, but even if it was as benign as alcohol, it, we all know that to drink alcohol in front of an alcoholic is effectively to put a stumbling block in front of them and cause them to sin, if there was nothing inherently idolatrous with drinking alcohol. Why would we be any less concerned about putting stumbling blocks in the way of, of Aboriginal people or any other people that we love? Why would we introduce this paganism to people who have not even got the background in it? I mean, right here in Brisbane CBD, I've seen Welcome to Country acknowledgements performed at the beginning of a church service. Why do we... What was so backward about our evangelism of Aboriginal people for the last 200 years that requires this recent introduction? 
Today, there's less than 2% of Aboriginal people who identify as pagan, and more than 54% of Aboriginal people identify as Christian. We've done fairly well evangelising this lost people without the need to introduce their paganism. What, what nonsense is this to introduce right now? What reckless, cavalier political correctness with an absence of biblical correctness? Perhaps well-meaning Christians may rationalise syncretism as unevangelized people reaching for the one true God revealed by creation and left without excuse for not worshipping him. The, the Apostle Paul was not so politically correct. Quote, Acts 17. We should not think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human skill and imagination. Therefore, although God has overlooked such times of ignorance, he now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he designated, having provided proof to everyone by raising him from the dead. No, your soul, your spirit is not going back to a kangaroo or a stone. Indeed, Paul demonstrated that the only loving thing to do when encountering a proud but pagan culture, such as the ancient Greek religion he was preaching to, is to instead preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to persuade them to abandon very religious times of ignorance. Let me quote again from Acts 17. Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious or superstitious in all respects. For as I went around and observed closely your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship without knowing it, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands, nor is he served by human idols, uh, if, as if he needed anything, because he himself gives life and breath and everything to everyone. From one man he made every nation of the human race to inhabit the entire earth, determining their set times and the fixed limits of the places where they would live, so they would search for God and perhaps grope around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And as I wrap up, there is this rebuke for the Australian church that is mixing religions. Joshua chapter 7, verse 11 to 12. The people of God, Israel, has sinned. They have violated my covenantal commandment. They have taken some of the riches. They have stolen them and deceitfully put them among their own possessions. The Israelites, the people of God, are unable to stand before their enemies. They retreat because they have become subject to annihilation. I will no longer be with you unless you destroy what has contaminated you. No Christian should place such an idolatrous stumbling block in the path to life of any person they aspire to love with the gospel. Rather, the challenge of the gospel is to die to self and to choose Jesus as Lord of all. Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And finally, this exhortation to respond with repentance to this rebuke. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 to 15. Now obey the Lord and worship him with integrity and loyalty. Put aside the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates and in Egypt and worship the Lord. If you have no desire to worship the Lord, then choose today whom you will worship, whether it be the gods of your ancestors beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. But I and my family, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May God be blessed. God bless Australia. And God bless you. And all the free people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Matt. Thank you, David. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, David. All right, so, I want to turn it on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. Turn it on for that. So the reason I asked Dave here this morning, and thank you for that message, is because you know, 
We're told to aspire for a quiet life, aren't we? But we don't always get that opportunity. Mm. And there are people out on the front lines there who are speaking boldly and sharing the bold truths of the Word of God. And you've heard Dave just share, outline the truths about Scripture, what it says on this issue, and the truths of what we're dealing with, the paganism that we're dealing with. And I have a bit of an advantage to you guys in this sense that I don't actually work in the secular world. I work with you guys. So I get to deal with Christians most of the time, and I have to go searching for opportunities to reach unbelievers. But many of you are in the workforce. You're in places where you're working around unbelievers. You're facing uh, this kind of stuff in the workplace. Mm. I was talking to someone about it just before church who's facing this sort of stuff. And I want, I want Dave to know, I want my friend to know that I stand with him and that there are Christians who stand Thank with you. him. But I also want you guys to know that we stand with you. Mm. And this church wants to back you up because sometimes Christians can feel alone out in the world, you know, that they're surrounded by all this uh, non-Christian culture. But it's important to understand that we, we want to walk through you with this and help you to be bold and stand with guys like Dave, who's been, who's been taken to the Human Rights Commission because he spoke the truth on this issue. So mm -hmm. I just want to pray for Dave and um, pray for his court case right now, and, um, just before we hand it over to the worship team. Amen. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for the heart you've given this man. I want to thank you for the words you've placed in his heart and for the wisdom he shared from Scripture. And Lord, this is a hard topic for all of us to put into practice. Uh, because of our idolatry of wanting to be loved by the culture. Uh, but Lord, we want to help you to give us the courage to love mm. the people of this world, but not love the things of this world. Mm. And I just want to pray that you would be with Dave as he goes through this court case, that you, uh, this commission inquiry, Lord, that you would just give him courage. Thank you for the support of people who have helped in different ways. Thank you for the lawyers that are working with him in this. We just want to pray for your protection, and we want to pray for success. Uh, because Lord, what's happened is unjust, it's, it's not right, and we just want to pray that you would be glorified in this situation. Uh, thank you for the witness you've put in David's heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you Pastor Matt.